Hi everyone, how are you guys doing? All right, so I'm starting a new series um, about teaching game development in C++ and SFML. All right, um, and what I want to do, my aim with this series is to teach people who have never programmed before the language of C++ and game development with SFML. Um, and so what I would like to do, or the game we're going to create is an RPG, an RPG game, right? That's kind of what I would like to do. Um, and so you might ask and wonder why, why are we learning C++? Why not C sharp, right? Uh, why are we doing SFML? Like most of you probably haven't heard of SFML or don't know what SFML is. Uh, why not Unity? Why not Unreal? Why SFML? Well, first of all, I want to teach you the way that I learned. Um, and I started with C++ and SFML, right? That's when I very started. Actually, that's a lie. When I first started programming, uh, the first language I learned was basic. Uh, from some YouTube video, and I still have that YouTube video today. And it's still actually up today, which is kind of cool. But when I started learning game development, I learned it with C++ and SFML. And what that does, the, the, like SFML, you don't have, it's not a game engine, right? There's no editor. Um, Nothing complex is there. It's just very bare bone tools. And all you have is the framework or the library and C++. There's nothing else to help you along the way. And I wholeheartedly believe that if you go that path, you will be a better programmer, right? Um, we could jump into Unity, right? And I'll, I'll do a series on Unity um, tutorial on how to do, how to program with Unity. And at some point, Unreal. Um, and I want to also do, I'm also doing in a, a series about developing your own game engine. But when I first started programming, I did it with SFM and Unreal. And I learned all the basics of programming. I didn't, I, I, I didn't have to think about, or I didn't get distracted by, I don't know, the editor and learning how to create a game object and a component and what a game object is and what a component is um, and how to add things, import 3D models and textures and materials and all these things, right? I started, I focused on programming, which what you want to do if you want to be a gameplay programmer. If your goal to become a gameplay programmer and do game and do game development, I wholeheartedly believe this is the way you want to go, right? You want to learn SFML and C++, or you want to start with not, I mean, that's not the end goal. This is just the starting, uh, how you start, right? Um, and then obviously you're done with SFML, you go learn an actual game engine. Now, one of the benefits is you're, you're learning things at the very low level, right? You're going to have, a lot more understanding of what the hardware is doing. You're going to get knowledge that game engines like Unity and Unreal, they don't teach you, right? All you do in Unreal or to get started in Unreal, you, you open the engine, you create a new project, you have a scene and you just grab a bunch of models, you add them, get you make a bunch of scripts and you add them and there you go. You have, you have something up and running. But on the inside, you don't know how the engine is working. You don't know the inner workings of the engine, which I believe is important. So we're going to start small, right? We're going to start with very bare bones. We're going to do C++, SFML, and then we're going to build on that knowledge. Um, we're going to make a simple game, and then we're going to make a level editor for that game. Uh, we're going to create all our own file format, or we might use JSON, SFML, uh, uh, or XML, or whatever file format out there, doesn't matter, right? But the point is, we're going to start very bare bones, and you're going to learn a lot more about computers and how to make a game from absolute scratch. There's nothing there. I mean, SFML is still 
like SFN is helping a lot, right? Because not that's not the bare bone. That's not the lowest level you can go. You can go lower than SFML. You can go all the way to OpenGL, right? Which I have a series about, uh, or I'm working on a series for Vulkan, right? We're not doing OpenGL, we're doing Vulkan. Um, but that's not the point, right? Um, so you can go lower than SFML. So SFML is still considered kind of a little bit high level. But you're gonna you're still gonna learn a lot more than a game engine. With the game engine, a lot of things are holding your hand, um, and I feel like I, I touch on that point a lot. So I'm just gonna move on to my next point, right? Um, which is and that, that's that's really why we're picking C plus plus SFML, right? I want to teach you what the hardware is doing, what's actually happening. Uh, with every single line of code you're writing, right? Uh, and you're going to practice that. Uh, and I'm going to give you simple projects and you're going to go and kind of work uh, with those projects um, and make your kind of all th your own tiny projects and kind of tiny modification to the project yourself so uh, you can learn. You know, it is very important to you uh, when, while watching these tutorials, extremely important. Try not to copy the code as much, right? Like, yes, you can put this tutorial on your other monitor, or you can look at the code and kind of copy it and see how it works. Do it for the first time, second time, that's fine. But try to, one, not memorize things, right? Uh, practice. There's a difference between memorization and practicing. If you try to memorize stuff, um, it's going to be so much difficult for you to program because programming is all about logic. It's not about memorizing. You're not supposed to memorize how to uh, create a function that makes the player move forward, right? That is too specific. What you memorize is, or what you practice on, is how to press the W key or the syntax of the language or how to create a variable or how to create a function or how to create a class, you know? Those things, and, and you don't like memorize them, you, you really practice them. You do them over and over and over. Um, and, and that's how you get better at programming. So it's, it's extremely essential whenever you're doing this, whenever you're watching this series, try to copy the code for the first time, right? Make it work on your own computer. But then later on, try to delete everything and rewrite it yourself right and, and and practice that way or try to do something else like solve a, a different problem uh, so let's say i tell you hey we're gonna have a character and i'm gonna give you exercises uh we're gonna say hey i have a character and they um and the character moves forward right and the exercise you want to do after i show you how to do that is try to make it move right or left or down right try to move it in different directions and so um again it's essential that you practice and do these things and not memorize. That's really important. Um, the second point that I want to go over uh, is that whenever you're doing this, um, I actually forgot my second point. What is my second point? So don't memorize, um, practice. Uh, number two, actually, I actually have no idea what my second point is. I guess it wasn't that important. Um, but the point is, you know, uh, try to uh, practice, don't memorize as much, and kind of understand what is happening on, on a lower level, uh, right? Uh, anything else I want to talk about? We're going we're gonna to break this into multiple sections, right? So the first thing we want to do is learn C++ from scratch. So I... I'm treating you as if you don't know anything about computers. You don't know what a computer is. You don't know what a motherboard is, a CPU or RAMs, none of that. I expect you to know none of that. And I expect you to not know any programming languages or have never programmed before. Um, so that's completely fine. So we're gonna go from the very, very uh, lowest level. I'm gonna introduce you to how the computer works. So what is what a motherboard? So uh, this lecture is probably gonna be an introduction to hardware and what's what's a computer made of, right? So you're gonna have a motherboard. I'm gonna explain what a motherboard is, what a CPU is, what uh, RAM is, what a GPU is, 
what a chipset is, all that stuff, and how all that communicates with each other to to see things on your screen. How can you program a computer, right? So I'm going to communicate all that information to you. And I'm also going to, um, so after doing that, after doing and talking about the hardware, we're going to talk about C++ itself, how to create a variable, how to create a function, how to create a class, object-oriented programming. Uh, we're going to also dive into functional programming if you don't want to go that style, but I am personally going to go with object-oriented programming kind of style. I'm going to show you the pitfalls and uh, the, the good things and the bad things of object-oriented programming, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. And then we're going to jump into SFML, right? And um, draw things on the screen. I want to make an RPG. So we're going to have a character with a sprite sheet, two animations. Well, first, we're just going to have a character that's moving around on the screen. And then we'll have animations. And then... Um, we'll have an enemy class and the enemy class is moving on the screen and so on and so forth, right? And I would like to do this all live, right? Um, I might take this video or this stream and cut it up into five to ten minute video sections, um, small sections. Uh, might do that. But um, yeah, that's that's kind of the goal, right? That's what I want to do. I want to make an RPG game with C++, SFML. I'm going to teach you the language, how everything works, the hardware. Um, and then hopefully by the end of this, we'll have a, a full RPG going, a full RPG working. Right? And then we're going to practice one another project. After doing the RPG, we'll probably do a shooter, a 2D shooter. So this is all 2D, by the way. So and then make a 2D shooter. Right. And this one, what I'm planning to do is add networking. I would like to play online and on LAN, uh, on local area network. We might also add that later on for the RPG, right? For the RPG game. Um, and then I'm going to start another project, right? Uh, I'll start a 2D platformer. Right. And I'll also add multiplier networking to it at some point, right? So we're going to do a lot of things in SFML and C++ and show you that Unreal is not the only way. Uh, Unity is not the only way to make games. Um, there's this kind of love and art of doing everything yourself that's kind of missing right now, which really makes me sad. Um, and... I mean, there's the hand mirror, uh, ha handmade hero movement that's going on, or it's been going on for the past six years now. Um, and he's like, um, I forgot what his name is. Uh, Cassie, Cassie Venturi, something like that. So if we go here. Um, so this guy, I forgot what his name is. Uh, does it say? Yeah, Cassie. He's really awesome. Like, he's a really, really cool guy. And uh, uh, he, he teaches you how to program from, from, like, absolute scratch, right? He's not even using SFML or anything. Um, and he's been doing that for six, year, six years, and I absolutely love him. He's absolutely great. Uh, such a cool dude. Um and so but but i don't want to go that low level right i want to go a little bit higher with sfml and then later on we'll we'll do game engine development stuff like that uh i just remember my second point by the way <laughs> i just remember my second point uh engine so i'll talk about this later on in a second but like i was saying it's it's really sad right now or it feels sad where beginners are jumping into Unreal or Unity immediately, right? That love of, hey, I'm, I'm going to do everything myself from scratch. And I'm going to go to forms like, um, right? I'm going to go into forms like gamedev.net or the SFML form. I, I don't even know, uh, like, uh, depending on how young you are whoever's watching this. I have no idea if you know what a form is to begin with. Um, but like that love of asking people questions and going on forms 
like gamedev.net or sfml form and kind of talking about all these things and doing everything yourself and trying to find solutions yourself rather than just googling it right thinking about the problem trying to make a or find a solution yes back then you would google obviously but but now it's like hey um it, it just there's some sort of magic that's missing i feel like uh and that really sucks i i wish people would know more about how unity works from the inside how to do games from scratch right i don't i don't want to use unity and have my project to be like i don't know 150 mb or 100 mb project just to have a single sprite on the screen like that's a lot of memory that's being wasted for just a simple thing now i'm not saying unity is bad unity is great and whoever goes and choose to program and start development with with unity that's fantastic don't get me wrong go to, go ahead do it that's great but i want to bring the magic right i want to bring back that magic of hey um there's nothing between me and the computer except code there's no ui there's 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 nothing i'm just programming thinking about problems solving them and i want to bring that magic back and whenever you're doing c++ and sfml you're just going to become a better programmer right because there's nothing hold there's nothing holding your hand or actually that's a lie right sfml is holding your hand but not much as unity right unity is holding your hand a lot uh there are a lot of things that unity does for you that you don't know about where sfml is kind of it's you and the computer and 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 the framework that's it that's all there is and good luck go make a game and people do make games a lot of great games are made that way a lot of great games um and i want to bring that here to you the other point that i want to talk about that i completely forgot is a game engine um you might uh you might discover while doing game programming that you don't like game programming <laughs> which is which is funny because that's what i discovered um like when i first when i first started obviously i wanted to make a game and i made a game in sfml and c plus and that was all great but then i discovered that i don't like game development right it's 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 nice like it's cool but what i'm really interested in is making a game engine i don't like um or i don't like that aspect of game development right i like to solve the hard problems i like to build a framework for other programmers to use um, and work with which is what an engine is right an engine just helps you build a game um and I discovered that's what I want to do, not make a game, right? Well, making a game is cool, but just not what I wanted. And the, the other reason was game development requires art, audio, which I was really terrible at. I didn't do art. I didn't do audio. And when I tried to find people who would want to work with me to do these things, they didn't want to do them right or i'd have to pay them for for that to happen and i just as a student who's just graduated from college i don't have that money i don't have i can barely afford to feed myself right so with all these factors i discovered hey engine programming is the thing that i like doing it's the thing that's the coolest um so you might discover while making this game that you enjoy that aspect of it you might enjoy the aspects of networking discover you love networking more than anything else or you love creating ai artificial intelligence or shader shader programming right um so that's why we're going such a low level or that's one of the reasons i'm going with such a low level uh, library and not going with um the game engine that was a long long intro that was that was a big rant that was a 20 minute rant i can't believe that's 20 minute rant apologize i if if you reach this point seriously i commend you uh, i can't believe you actually got to this point of the video but 
that's what we are doing, right? And this, these are all my reasons of why I would like to do SFML in C++. Um, again, so my goal is we're going to make an RPG, a 2D RPG, a 2D shooter, a 2D platformer. We're going to network, add networking on all of them, right? Um, but the, the code we're going to write the first time is going to be messy. We're going to improve it and improve it and improve it. So at the same time, when I'm going to, I'm going to write code sometimes intentionally to be bad, just to show you the bad way of doing things and then how I would do it myself. Right. Um, that's it. That's, that's all, that's all that is. Um, with that in mind, I would like to jump into talking a little bit about the hardware. What, what's a computer? How does it work? What's inside a computer? How does it do all that it does, right? All these, these things that I like to talk about and kind of important. All right, so let's do this. So let's start with what's a computer and let's be a big different color. Uh, maybe white, white is nice. I like white. So let's start talking about what a computer is. Well, essentially a computer is just a device. So here's a device, right? Um, all it does, it takes some sort of input, right? So you have an input that's going into a device. Um, there's some sort of processing that's happening here. You'll, you'll also, you'll just discover one thing about me. I can't spell for shit. I'm the worst uh, speller ever. So some words are going to be wrong. And that's fine. I gave up on learning spelling. Anyways, so you have an input, you have some sort of processing that's happening on, on that device, and then you have an output. And then you have a feedback loop, right? Right? You have a feedback loop um, of you, the user, seeing what's happening and reacting to it. So I'll give you an example. Whenever you're playing a video game, let's say you're playing a first person shooter and then you press the W key, right? I press the W, I expect my character to move forward. The input was me pressing W. Processing what is the computer trying to figure out why you press W, what to do when you press W. So in my code, I said, hey, my character is going to move forward. Right, that's going to be the processing. The output is my character actually moving forward on the screen. Right? And that's what a computer is. And then your feedback loop is you, the human, seeing what's going on on the screen and reacting to it, either continuing to press W or to press another key. Right? Um, so that's, that's, that's what a computer is, essentially. It takes some input, it processes that input, and gives you an output accordingly. Another example would be, let's say you have a simple calculator, right? The input would be five plus two. Well, five plus two are three different inputs, but let's assume they're one input, right? Those are inputs. The processing is adding those numbers and the output is the actual values, which is five plus two is seven. And you seeing seven and deciding what to do next, which is the feedback loop. That's what a computer is. Now, there are hundreds of thousands of computers everywhere, all around us. In a single household, um, there could be anywhere between 5 to 10 to 20 different computers just in that household, even if you're living alone. So we can count a few things uh, where a computer might exist. So the most obvious part is your PC, right? Your PC, let me... Get another slide. Your PC over here is a computer, right? Whether you have Windows, Macintosh, Linux, whatever operating system you're running on, your PC is a computer, right? You're watching this on probably a PC, maybe a tablet, maybe a phone, right? But you have a PC in your computer. Next, you have a tablet, right? Your tablet is a computer. Uh, it has a screen. It has an input device, which is your touch screen. It has a processor, RAM, all that stuff, right? Next, your phone. Your phone is a computer. Now, these are all the obvious stuff. Next, your smart TV. 
your TV is a computer. It has, um, it has a processor. It processes processes things and displays it on the screen. Um, your washing machine. I'm just gonna do WM, washing machine. The washing machine has a computer. It tries to figure out how much water it should put it put in, when to put the soap, and how many cycles it should do. Right. Uh, your dishwasher. DW, uh, your dishwasher is a computer has a computer in it, right? Um, again, same thing, soap and and all that. Um, right. What else is there? Your refrigerator. Right. Your refrigerator has um a computer that monitors, uh, your temperature. It regulates your temperature, right? Your AC, air conditioning, has a computer that does the same thing. Uh, your watch, if you have a smartwatch, like the Galaxy Watch, or your iPhone, or your, what is it, the Apple Watch? Yeah, the Apple Watch, right? Your Apple Watch is a computer, right? Uh, Xbox, PS, uh, PlayStation, uh, Nintendo, all these are different computers, right? Uh, your router, right? The thing that you use to like I uh, get the internet and Wi-Fi those are those there's a computer inside it right your car this is the last example <laughs> not a lot of examples this is the last example I promise your car your car alone has anywhere between one to ten different computers in a single car depending on the car you're driving uh, the most basic computer is your ECU right uh, your uh, electronic computer units no sorry engine <laughs> whoops engine computer units something like that yeah I think it's engine computer unit so your ECU is responsible for monitoring your engine uh, figuring out how much fuel it should give your engine how much air it should give your engine so it does the whole combustion thing right um, it has to give the right amount of fuel and air to keep your engine running healthy, not too lean, not too rich, um, not too much fuel, not too little fuel, not too much air, not too little air, right? Just the perfect amount to keep it running smoothly and without any problems. Otherwise, your engine would freaking explode. So there are thousands and thousands of thousands of computers, your laptop, obviously, right? Um, and they're all around us and they manage our entire day to day life without them. Like we, we would we wouldn't be where we are right now. We are heavily dependent on computers. All right, cool. So that's your introduction of what a computer is. How many computers are there? Now, let's talk about um, what's inside a computer, right? So let's do that. Inside a computer, there are a few basic things. I'll start with the basic thing. Or we'll start with the basic component. Well, it's not really basic, but we'll start with the CPU. Right? What does the CPU stand for? Your CPU is the central processing unit. Right? It's the brain of your computer. It does all the processing that's required to run your computer. Right? It's your brain, basically. Um, we'll talk a lot in depth, a lot more in depth about what a CPU is, but for now, essentially just, it's your brain, right? It's your computer brain. It does all the processing, all the math, um, uh, all that, right? Next, your, your CPU is connected to your RAM, RAM or memory, right? What's RAM? Essentially, RAM, whenever you go and get you or buy a computer, they're going to tell you your computer has anywhere between any of these values, right? Let's pick different colors. 16, 32, 64, um, different color. 
128 GB of RAM, right? Or if you have a really low end, it'll be like 8 GB. Let's pick a different color just to be consistent here. 8 GB, right? So RAM or memory is where your applications are temporarily stored when you first open them for the first time. Or not the first time, when you first open them. When you open an application, whether it's Photoshop, a video game, your Chrome browser, a calculator, any application you open, it's temporarily stored in memory. All right. And the reason for that is memory is super, super fast. Well, actually, memory is really slow, but it's a lot faster than the second component we're going to talk about or the other component we're going to talk about. Um, so let me do this. Your I.O. Input output devices. All right. And some of your input output devices are your hard disk or SSD, right? Uh, those are connected uh, over here. Um, uh, input output devices. Actually, hold on. What am I? What am I saying? Input out input and output devices are dependent on keyboard, mouse, monitor, printer. These are your input output devices. So your hard drive and SSD. They're not considered as input output, are they? Oh, I wonder. Hold on. We're going to have to make sure of that information. Just do a Google search. Um, com computer diagram. I don't want to give you wrong information, so I just want to make sure here. So you have your input output. Yeah, yeah that's all good. That's all fancy. Um... Output data. Uh, here we go. Oh, that's data. Okay, so this is your I/O. Okay, so this input device is um, actually that's a pretty helpful diagram. <laughs> we'll use that. Can you? Can you, can you move? Hello? Can I copy you? I can't control this page. What's up? What is going on? Did they really disable copying and pasting from this page or selecting and highlighting everything? That's lame. That is very lame. Yeah, that is super lame, right? Uh, input, input devices are your keyboard, mouse, and things like that, and your tablet or Output is your monitor, printer, and speaker. This is data. So we're going to talk about data. Sorry, apologies for that. Sorry. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put IO over here. Uh, but we already made this total. Oh, it's kind of the same two lines, really. We'll do IO here. And this is data. All right. So uh, you have your hard disk and SSD, right? And this is where you store your your games or photos and images forever right so if you turn off your computer and turn it back on all that data still exists on your computer they're not gone they still exist right your hard drive and ssd compared to memory they're very slow very very slow hard drive uh, hard disk is super slow and ssd is much faster but still super slow compared to your ram and memory so essentially what happens when I play a game, let's say I'm playing GTA, right? When I double click on that game, when I open it for the first time or open it, doesn't matter when I open it, right? Um, or if I open the ca uh, calendar, right? Here's my calendar. Or if I open my calculator, right? For the first time. Again, I keep saying the first time. It doesn't matter whether it's the first or second or third time. When you open your calculator, right? This program existed in RAM, in memory, and so is GTA. GTA is what? 50 GB? Is it? Or 100 GB? I think it's 100 GB of memory, uh, of RAM. Uh, sorry, not RAM. 100 GB, uh, the size of the game. So that GTA, it's saved into your, your hard drive, 
an SSD. They exist in there. Before, they existed somewhere here. So you had a server. So let's say you downloaded it from Steam. So this is the Steam server. And you downloaded this into download. So you've downloaded the game into your hard disk and SSD. So you basically move that game from Steam server into your hard disk and RAM. Now, this is a slow process, obviously, depending on how fast your internet speed, that process can take anywhere between if you have a really fast computer, sorry, not the fast computer. If you have a really fast internet connection, that process can take anywhere between a minute, two minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, a day two days if you have a really really bad internet or even a week right i remember way way back then in 2006 when i i downloaded like a 9 gb game downloaded pirated i pirated a 9 gb game that took an entire week to download which was funny so when you have your game right? You're downloading it from Steam server into your hard disk and hard drive. So now you moved it into this area, right? Now it exists here. Now you want to play it. Now the computer can just, the CPU can just read the files into you, uh, read the files from your SSD and hard drive and just work with them. However, loading screens will be extremely excruciatingly slow. If you think GTA right now is slow, the loading screen of GTA is slow. It might take, I don't know, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes to load. If you just load it immediately, or if if you if you're reading that data, if the CPU have to has to go to RAM and SSD to process that data, it will take five, ten minutes for a loading screen to happen. RAM is really, really small, uh, slow. And you're gonna you're gonna have like five FPS because the CPU keeps going to RAM and S uh, sorry, the CPU keeps going to your hard disk and SSD over and over to like process stuff and save stuff, uh, save it into your hard disk, right? It moves, it goes here, it finds out what data it needs to process, it goes here, it saves it, and so on and so forth. So your CPU and hard disk are always communicating together. That's a really slow thing. So what we've done, or what engineers have done, they've created RAM. And so they said this, your CPU, when you first when you open a game for the first time, what happens? A small chunk of that game is loaded temporarily into RAM. So obviously GTA is 100 GB, and you have let's say 16 uh, GB of RAM. Obviously that's GTA is not gonna fit in its in its entirety into RAM. So what we do, we load a small chunk of that game into memory. All right. And we small uh, we load a small chunk into memory, and that chunk would be one GB, uh, four GB, uh, I don't know, five GB, something like that, right? However, the game is designed, but we load a single level of that game into memory, and now the CPU instead of the 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 processor communicating uh, with the hard disk at all times, it's now communicating with RAM. So now these guys are talking with each other. And this is a, th a hundred times faster than your hard drive and SSD. SSDs are super, super slow compared to memory. So that's why you have a loading screen. Whenever you have a loading screen in the game or whenever you are opening Photoshop, Photoshop takes a while to load. So what's happening is your CPU instructing or your CPU going to your hard drive and loading this data into memory, right? Uh, loading one, two, three, four, five, six GB into memory and saving it temporarily into memory. And so now the CPU is communicating between the memory or between RAM and, and itself at, at all times. Okay. Now, when you close the application, obviously this memory is deleted. It's gone, right? Uh, GTA still exists on your hard disk and your S uh, your SSD, but it's removed from memory. It's moved from RAM. 
And that's why if you have a small amount of memory, you can't open too many applications, right? Um, and so that's what RAM is for. That's why it exists. It exists as a temporary storage for the CPU to communicate with. Super, super fast storage. Okay. Um, and that's, that's what memory is, right? And that's why the bigger memory or the bigger RAM, the better. Because you can open multiple applications, a lot of applications at the same time, which is cool. All right, cool, fantastic. Um, one other thing is, uh, GTA is an open world game, but let's say you're playing a game where it has multiple levels, right? And you have multiple loading screens. So that's why, you know, when you first, let's say you're on the first level, it loads that level into memory, then you play it. When you're done, it unloads it, it removes it from memory, and then level two, is now loaded from the hard disk to memory, right? So, um, so that's happening, right? Um, so that's why we have loading screens. Cool. Okay, so we have our RAM. That's what memory is, and that's why it exists. Now, obviously, again, when you turn off your computer, everything in memory is deleted. It's erased. And when you open your computer for the first time, or again, I keep saying the first time, when you open your computer, uh, that data is loaded into memory. Or if you open a single application, that data is loaded in memory. Cool. Um, so that's your CPU. That's your RAM. That's your SSD and hard drive. And you have, here you have your I.O. We already saw that. You like your keyboard. Keyboard. Uh, mouse. Uh, Wacom. Tablet. Whatever you use for input output. The touch screen. All that stuff, right? Cool. I hope this makes sense. Um, I hope this you all understand all that. Now, you might have a question and you're like, what happens if we run out of RAM? What if I fill all this to 16 GB? It's possible. What happens then? Well, now your operating system, your Windows, right? Whatever operating system you're using, whether it's Windows, Mac OS or Linux, Linux, right? Whatever operating system you're using, it's going to now use your hard disk and or SSD as RAM, as temporary storage. And you will notice your computer performance dropping dramatically and your frame rate dropping dramatically. And so your, your, your operating system will try to do its best to remove application, unused application, uh, compress the data inside memory. But if it fills up and it did everything it, it, it needed to, now it has to use your hard disk and um, SSD as temporary memory, right? As, as RAM. And that is really, really slow. Um, so that's essentially it, right? The next part I want to talk about is your GPU or graphics uh, processing unit. What's what's a GPU, right? Why do we use GPUs? Well, essentially, um, GPUs are used. Well, GPU is a graphic uh, processing unit or an accelerator. Hey, welcome, cool super gamer. Welcome to the stream. Um, your GPU is essentially a device that processes uh, geometry and triangles. So in video games, everything in the world is made of triangles. We love triangles and the GPU love triangles. Um, and so you might wonder how exactly do we draw a circle if we have, if the GPU all it does is triangles, right? How does that happen? Well, think about it. So if I have a circle over here, right? And I can make it, I can make multiple triangles from the circle, right? Which is cool, right? So a bunch of triangles, uh, we made a circle from a bunch of triangles. And so uh, GPU exists. Let's make another line over here. Right, and put your GPU over here. Now your GPU has its own memory, 
its all its own reserve for memory. Let's call it's called VRAM, right? Just like how you have, or just like how your CPU has RAM over here, right? Your GPU also has RAM. So, uh, so how does this work really? Well, essentially, when you open a game like GTA or GTA, here we go. If you open that game, what's gonna happen? is the cpu first is going to go to your hard disk and ssd it's going to load that data into ram right the first level for example well gta is an open world game but that doesn't matter it's going to load it into ram and then your cpu and ram is going to communicate with g with your gpu so it's going to load um data from your gpu sorry it's going to load data from your ram into your gpu ram and again, that goes back to the same example of why do we have memory? Why not just load everything? For, why not just load everything from your hard disk and SSD? Why do we need RAM? Well, same thing. Why do we need VRAM? VRAM is much faster. It's a lot faster than your RAM over here, right? Rather than your CPU having to uh, kind of your CPU and GPU having to communicate with, with RAM all the time, we can take some of that data and put it into your GPU immediately. So your GPU can access that data a lot faster, right? Let's say this is your character over here, right? Um, and so essentially, and this is the bus, the kind of the, the line uh, that's communicating between the CPU and the GPU, this line is called PCI Express or PCIe, right? Um, thank you so much, Super Gamer. <laughs> Appreciate that um and so that's what's happening all the time right you open a game in gta it moves from your ssd and your hard drive into ram into your temporary memory your cpu will take some of that data your 3d models your textures your images your uh, anything that needs to be processed by the gpu it moves it into G the gpu memory and the gpu is, is processing that data so that's kind of the entire architecture of a computer and what happens when you open a game uh, and and how you know all that happens uh, which is kind of cool we'll dive a lot in a lot more detail about hardware and how all of that works um, but for now I kind of I kind of want to move on uh, to, to something else all right so we've done that we have we know what a GPU is we know what RAM is we know what input and output devices are and we know what your hard drive and SSD is, right? Which is great. The next part I would like to talk about is what's inside a CPU, right? We know that the CPU is your central processing unit, but what's inside it? Well, it's sectioned into multiple things and I'm gonna only go high level stuff. We'll dive in a lot more detail later on, but a part of your CPU is your ALU. An ALU stands for uh, Arithmetic Logic Unit. So any math you're doing, um, that's happening on the ALU. Whenever you're doing 5 plus 5, 10 multiplied by 10, um, 1 divided by 0, right? All these things are happening on the ALU. Um, the next thing we have are registers. Registers are an extremely small amount of memory on the CPU itself, right? So now we've seen like there are multiple levels of memory. You have your Steam server, you're getting the game, putting it on your hard disk and SSD, and then taking part of that, moving it to a faster, uh, a faster kind of part of your computer, which is your RAM. And now we're moving part of that into your register. What we move into registers are variables, right? Like your health. I can't spell health. Here you go. Health, uh, damage, uh, what weapon you're currently carrying, like all these small variables, one of these guys are being moved into a register, right? And they're stored in a register. So the ALU and registers are always com communicating between each other. So let's say you want to figure, you get hit by a bullet and you want to figure out uh, how much damage you've taken. So what the CPU will do 
it will go into RAM over here, grabs your health variable, right? And save it into one of those registers. And now your ALU, your arithmetic processing unit or logic unit, communicates with, with your register and both of these guys talk with each other to do the math operation. Once that math operation is done, it puts it back into RAM, right? Um, and so that, that exists. Now, the other part of your CPU is you have your cache. Cache is super fast, really, really, really fast. It's not faster than your register, but it's definitely faster than your RAM. And there's multiple levels of it. I don't want to dive into cache right now. I'll keep it for later, like later on. But um, essentially, you just want to remember that cache is another type of memory that is super fast, which is great. All right. So, um, and and that's really it. So whenever whenever we want to work on a specific variable, uh, I'll go into RAM. I will grab that variable, store it into my register, do some math operation on it, go into my ALU, uh, the register and the ALU will communicate between each other, we'll do the math operation, and they will be stored back into memory. And obviously cache is there uh, to speed things up, and it's a small amount of memory. memory. We'll talk about that for a later date. That's essentially your computer architecture. That's everything. Right. So I want to go oh, uh, uh, before before I go over all of this, uh, I would like to create a small diagram in here to show you uh, the types of memory and how fast they are. Right. So at the bottom, you have your server. You have your Steam server at the very bottom. Right. Next. After your server, you have your HDD. And SSD. Next, you have your RAM. Next, you have your cache. Next, you have your register. Slow, sorry, a billion, year, a billion times slower than registers. Super slow, extremely slow. Takes years, months uh, to get anything from a server. SSD and hard drive, unbelievably slow. Still faster than your, your, your server somewhere in the world, but a lot faster. Next, RAM. RAM is much faster than your SSD and hard drive. Cache is even faster. And finally, you have your registers. So this is kind of the pyramid you have of the very slowest amount of memory to the very fastest amount of memory or type of memory, not amount, type of memory. Right? So that's it. That's kind of your hierarchy. Now, I want to go over this one last time, really quick, see what happens when you open a game for the first time, how your computer communicates between all its parts. And then I want to jump in into um, uh, kind of leave the hardware parts and kind of jump into programming. Okay. So this is your CPU. You turned on your computer for the first time. Your operating system, Windows, Linux, whatever operating system you're running on, is loaded into memory. It exists in memory, right? It was loaded from your hard disk. First, it was in your hard disk, and the CPU loaded that operating system into memory, right? And the processor and, the, and RAM are communicating between each other. So now, you double-click on GTA and open GTA for the first time. Again, I keep saying the first time you open GTA, right? Your GTA, uh, or let's assume you don't have GTA yet. So you go into Steam, download GTA into your hard disk. So we move GTA from a server on the internet into your hard disk and SSD. Now GTA exists in your hard disk and SSD. And let's say that took I don't know, a day to download if you have a really slow internet. Now you double click to open GTA. Part of GTA was moved and loaded into RAM. Okay. The CPU will send the command and 
load your game or part of your game into memory. Your CPU is also communicating with your GPU um, and takes that small part that you just loaded into RAM and loads it into the GPU memory to run even faster. And now your GPU is rendering stuff. It's drawing triangle, it's drawing your main menu, it's drawing your buttons, it's drawing all the cool effects that you're seeing on the screen. Um, and now your CPU is just communicating between RAM and the GPU. If the GPU needs something, uh, f f like, I don't know, a 3D model or anything in the game, it'll communicate to RAM. It'll go, hey, the GPU will be like, hey, I need this 3D model. The CPU will be like, okay, don't worry. It'll go into RAM, grab the, see if it exists there. If it doesn't exist, it'll load it from the hard disk into memory. Once it's in memory, it will take it from memory and load it into your GPU and be like, hey, yo, here's, here it is. Take it, use it. And the GPU will render it. And then the GPU might be like, hey, I need this texture or this, um, yeah, I don't know, a car 3D model. I'll do the same. And so your CPU is always communicating, communicating between your RAM and VRAM and always fetching stuff from your hard disk if you need to load something, you have a loading screen, right? And that's your entire architecture of everything, right? That's everything you have, which is cool. So now that you know what a computer does, how it works, uh, we can move on to programming and, and doing other things. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can drop them into YouTube comments. And what I can do is I'll read them and I can make a small video explaining that simple question. Um, I would like to make this a little bit more interactive, right? So if you're not tuned in to the stream, uh, whatever question you have, just drop it and I'll just answer it. I'll make a video and answer it. Um, that's it really. That's all that is. I know that was a lot of information. Um, sort of what I suggest you do, kind of go over this, watch it again and kind of try to digest it. Uh, and again, if you don't understand something, let me know. I'll make sure to explain it better or make a follow-up video to try to explain things a little bit better or answer any questions. Cool. So that's kind of the process. Um, by the way, if you don't know what a GPU is, it's a graphic processing unit. It's your graphics card. Uh, it's a hardware accelerator. Accelerator. Um, it just, all it does, it renders things, 3D models, geometry, triangles, and things like that. Cool. So now we're done with that. Now that's all that is done. Um, and we know what a computer is and how it works. Uh, we can move on. Uh, one more thing I might have glossed over is PCI Express. PCI Exp Express is just, um, it's a 16 line, it's a 16 line uh, connection between your GPU and CPU. So it's 16 like copper wires, if you, if you will, connected between your GPU and CPU. And they're communicating through those wires, right? Which is kind of cool. Oops, bumped the mic. All right, cool. That's it. That's your computer architecture. That's your introduction to computer hardware uh, or your 101 to computer hardware. Um, okay, so how do we start programming? How do we jump into programming? How do we start making games and stuff? Well, CPUs, unfortunately, CPUs and computers they understand one thing and one thing only. Ones and zeros. Right? That's all they understand. So in order for me to tell, to program the, uh, the processor or tell it what to do, I need to do that with ones and zeros. All right. So it's really difficult to tell the computer how to work with ones and zeros. Very difficult um, in terms of humans, right? Humans, like if, if, I, if, you give you, if I give you uh, these ones and zeros and I ask you, what do they mean? 
even if you if at some point in your lifetime knew what that meant you'll forget because well they're just freaking they're a bunch of ones and zeros there's no way you're gonna remember what this string of ones and zeros meant right so rather than uh programming or telling the computer what to do with ones and zeros what we do is we use a programming language and the programming language uh, can be c plus plus it can be c sharp it can be assembly it can be python it can be javascript there are thousands there are thousands and thousands of programming languages out there. So when we program in any of these languages, let's not talk about JavaScript and Python for now. Let's just talk about C Sharp and C++, right? When we program in C++ and C Sharp, that language, that programming language, so if I tell the computer, print, let me make a different color. Print, hello, world, right? So if I issue this command in this programming language, the computer doesn't understand this. So what, what's going to happen is that this has to be converted to ones and zeros for the computer to understand. The way this happened by using a, a piece of software called a compiler. The compiler will take this, this line of code, translate it into ones and zeros. So a compiler is literally a translator. It just takes this code and converts it to ones and zeros. That's what a compiler does, right? Um, now, once you once you have those ones and zeros you need another piece of program called the linker whenever whenever you're writing code you're not writing the code in a vacuum right uh you're not you're relying on someone else's code whenever i'm writing c i'm not just doing c with sfml uh, uh, sorry, when I'm, whenever I'm writing a game in SFML, I am not just relying on SFML. SFML is relying on OpenGL. OpenGL is relying on the graphics drivers. The graphics drivers relying on someone, something else, right? You're always writing code. Your code always depends on other code. It's not in a vacuum. So what the linker does, essentially, it takes your ones and zeros, your code that you've written, and takes it packages it and link it with other ones and zeros from other companies like for example microsoft right um i spelled microsoft wrong hold on let me spell that right microsoft there you go and then you have sfml and then you have opengl Right? All these ones and zeros, it takes your code, it takes these guys' code, this guy's code, this guy's code, they all go into the linker. Right? They're all going into the linker and they're all packaged together to give you the final program called the exe or your executable file. Your, e your exe is a file that you finally open. You double click to open in Windows. Right? And so, in order for us to start programming, we need the linker to link our code with other people's code, and we get the exe. We need the compiler to translate our code from C++ or whatever language we write in into ones and zeros. And then we also need an assembler. You know how I said the compiler turns these things into ones and zeros or turns your code into ones and zeros? I may have lied. Whenever you're compiling your code, 
it your code actually goes so this is your code right this is your line of code it goes into a compiler it turns into assembly code what is assembly code well assembly is a programming language um and it's a lower level programming language what that means is that it takes a lot more code a, a low level programming language is a language where you have to write a lot more code to accomplish the same thing in a high level language so for example i have a print statement over here that says print hello world right this is a sing this is a single line of code when it gets compiled to assembly it gets compiled to small instructions so this lines of code this line of code turns into 10 lines of code or 100 li or 20 lines of code or 30 lines of code uh, which are all instructions to tell the cpu exactly what to do let me give you a brief example when i tell you hey go to the supermarket grab me a loaf of bread or grab me some milk that's a pretty simple instruction um in your head you know that you have to go to the store to get some milk fantastic but there are a lot more steps to do in between getting off the couch to buying milk from the supermarket and bringing it home so what are those what are those things you have to get out of the couch uh you have to wear some shoes uh you have to wear some clothes if you weren't wearing clothes for whatever reason open the door or walk to the door open the door uh, press the elevator button wait for the elevator get on the elevator press the elevator uh, plus i don't know the lobby uh, to go to the lobby uh, from the lobby let's say you don't own a car right um get on the street uh find the taxi uh get in the taxi tell the taxi where to go the taxi will drive you um taxi will you'll pay the taxi money uh you'll get you open the door of the taxi car uh get out go to the store open the door go find milk grab the milk you see and buy the milk and and so on and so forth right there are so many instructions between me telling you ho hey not ho hey <laughs> go grab uh go buy me some milk and come back right there's so many instructions in between so same kind of thing right so whenever i give you an instruction like this print hello world there's so many other things you have to do in between to print hello world on the screen so this code is converted into a an assembly language or a lower le lower level language called assembly and if you don't know what assembly looks like, it looks like this. Right? This is assembly. Right? There are so many things happening. And it's such a lower level language. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So it says load, load, multiply, load, load, add, load, load, add, right? bunch of registers it's a much lower level language than um, c sharp or c plus plus so this code get translated or it gets compiled we say it gets compiled from c plus plus to assembly all right um now this assembler okay so i'm gonna actually Oh my god, do this. Okay. Uh, compiled. I I messed up a little bit. Uh, let me take this entire area. Oh, I, I wasn't organizing my thoughts, which is not good. Okay. We'll deal with this example later. Okay. So, I have my line of code. It goes into a compiler. It gets compiled into assembly. This assembly language now is taken to another program called the assembler. 
this assembler will take the assembly code. Okay, so this is my assembly code. Add load sub add right. Hello world gets compiled into assembly. Assembly is taken into another program called an assembler. Your assembler turns this into ones and zeros. Right? So this is the thing that is that's turning your code into ones and zeros, the assembler. And then in here, the linker will take your ones and zeros, link it with other code, and then the linker will finally give you your exe over here, which is kind of your goal. Get the exe file. Right? This is the end goal over here. Right? Um, now let me go over this one last time real quick. C++, uh, C++ code, print hello world, goes into a compiler. Compiler compiles the code into an assembly language, into a lower level language. This assembly language looks something like this. Once it gets compiled into assembly, it, it goes to the next stage, the assembler. The assembler takes this code, turns it into ones and zeros. These ones and zeros will be taken into the linker. This uh, this uh, th these ones and zeros will be taken into the linker. The linker will link your code, your ones and zeros, with OpenGL, SFML, Microsoft, and someone else's code. When all this code is linked together, it will generate your final .exe file that you can open and use and play. Right, that's your final application. This is the entire pipeline. Right, this is the entire process of what happens when you write a piece of code into how you get the final application, right? And the reason it's called a pipeline is because there are multiple stages. It's like a pipe, right? There are multiple stages into this pipeline. Your code goes into the compiler. It gets compiled into assembly. It goes into the assembler. It gets uh, assembled into ones and zeros. Your ones and zeros are linked with other code. Your other code and your ones and zeros are finally uh, being turned into an exe by the linker. Cool. That's the entire process. Um, now, one last program we need over here is called the text editor. Right? This is your text editor. You need the text editor to write this line of code. Okay? So these are all the stages. line of code goes in here okay your text editor uh, you write this line into your text editor text editor takes that line compiles it assemble it ones and zeros link it and goes and give you the final exe right now one thing i want to talk about what happens in here what does the compiler do well we said that it turns the code into assembly right that we know that but what else does it do while turning your code into assembly, it also optimizes your code. It makes it a lot faster. So, for example, if your code, right, and, and one thing I want to talk about is instructions. You're always giving instructions to, the, to your CPU. So, this is your CPU over here. It understands instructions. Instructions like display something on the screen, add this number, divide this number, subtract this number, do this, do that, right? These are all instructions I send to the computer. This line of code could be 20 instructions, 20 different instructions to just print something on the screen. It could be 30 instructions, 40 instructions, whatever, how many, right? So what a compiler does, it optimizes or tries to reduce these instructions. So let's say this line of code, normally it's 20 instructions, 20 assembly instructions. What the compiler does, tries to figure out a way to uh, reduce this 20 to 10, right? And then once it does that, it sends it to the assembler. Now, why does it try to optim? Why does it try to reduce 20 from 10? Like, what's the difference? Why not just send 20? Well, 
fewer steps, meaning faster execution of the program, your game or your software will run a lot faster with fewer instructions. So again, going going to the whole analogy of ho, I keep saying ho, Jesus Christ, going back to the analogy of saying, hey, go grab me some milk from the store. You could have 20 instructions to do that. Uh, go open door, elevator, uh, get a taxi, pay the taxi, go to the store, pay the store and get milk, right? Those are, let's say, 20 instructions. You could optimize that by opening your phone and ordering online. That's five instructions. You didn't have to move your butt. You didn't have to move your butt at all. Now you're just watching TV until the milk arrives. So now I've cut down on the amount of work I have to do for the milk to come to me, right? Or to get milk, which is cool. So that's what the compiler does. It optimizes your code. It reduces the amount of instructions needed for your CPU to execute, which is awesome, right? So that line of code goes in, uh, is written in text editor. Compiler takes this line of code, optimizes your assembly code, or optimi optimizes your code, turns it into assembly, and sends it to the assembler. Now your assembler is receiving code that is optimized and is running as fast as possible. This assembly code is now translated to ones and zeros. Those ones and zeros are sent to the linker. The linker takes your code and other people's code and turns it into a final exe, an executable file. That's the pipeline. That's what happens when you write a, a piece of software from the very start till the very end, right? That's the entire thing. Cool. So. We need all these softwares in order to write any code. We need the text editor, compiler, assembler, linker. Luckily, we don't need to grab all of these guys. We can just use something called an IDE. I can type or write an IDE. An IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. So what's an integrated development environment? An integrated development environment is something like Visual Studio, right? Or Xcode or Android Studio, or um, if you don't know what any of these are, essentially an IDE is a piece of software that contains a text editor, contains a compiler, contains an assembler, contains a linker, all in one package and a lot more. So it's just a, a software that contains all these things and you just download that software and you have everything you need to start programming which is great right so that's what we need what we are going to use as of the date of writing or recording this video is 31st october happy halloween by the way visual studio uh 2019 community edition is the latest version we have 2019 is the latest version we have currently right 2022 is coming out on 5th of november so mark your calendars 5th of november that's when 22 is coming out so that's in five days right so you can download that if you're watching this video later on I can download 2022. If this video hasn't been updated in 10 years, maybe 30. 22 is, uh, is out. Wait, that's a thousand year. <laughs> that, my video won't survive for a thousand year. I mean, sorry, 2032. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So if you're watching this video in 10 years, uh, you can download the 2032 edition, right? Jesus Christ, 3022. Oh my God. All right, right? So. 2019 is the one we have right now. In five days, we'll get the 2022 version. Whichever one you you pick to choose is fine. doesn't matter. Uh, but we're going to download the Community Edition. I already made a video about this and why uh, we're using the Community Edition. There are a bunch of versions. Community, uh, Professional, and Enterprise. Uh, community is for single developers. Uh, professional is for a team of developers. Uh, like a, a 
medium to large team. Uh, enterprise is for, well, enterprise is for corporations. You're not a corporation, so you don't need it. Uh, you can still work in a team with a community edition. Just the professional has more tools um, to help that. And you just don't need it. Um, the professional and enterprise, they're paid. Community is free. So you can just use that. Right. So that's an IDE, an integrated development environment. Visual Studio uh, is an IDE. Uh, you can also use Xcode. Xcode is on Mac. Um, but we're not using Xcode because we don't have a Mac. Right. Cool. So we're going to get an IDE. Great. We know what happens when you write code, how it gets compiled, assembled, linked, and you finally get the final exe. We know how uh, the computer architecture works. You have a CPU, memory, hard drive, SSD, GPU. All this data is being communicated between the CPU, memory, GPU, and hard drive. Things are loaded into memory. You have cache. We still haven't talked about cache. We'll talk about cache later on. I don't want to overcomplicate the subject. I already gave you way too much information for a beginner. I apologize about that. If you don't know, understand something, rewatch it. Uh, if it's not clear, ask a question in the comments again. I'll make a video. I'll explain it some more. If it feels overwhelming, that's completely fine. I apologize. My mistake. I gave you way too many information for a beginner. Um, but I kind of want to kind of want to run you through everything. Um, but it, this will make a lot more sense later on in your career. Um, if you're planning on becoming a programmer, right? Uh, this is slowest to the fastest, fastest type of memory. Server is not really memory, but let's consider it a memory for now. Uh, what else? What else I would want to talk about? Let me think, let me think, let me think. What else, what else, what else? Um, something I glossed over, or actually, I didn't gloss over. Um, I didn't quite gloss over it. I wanted to talk about the driver. So between your, well, this is an application kind of thing, not, not hardware level. Um, so I might, hmm, how do I approach this? I want to explain where a driver is to you, which is kind of useful. Okay. Uh, I'll talk about it in here in a separate section. Um, this is the last section. I promise this is the last section before we jump into programming. Um, now here's your uh, computer, right? This is your PC. Okay. Next, you have your OS operating system like Windows. Man, enough with the white. There's so much white. Let's pick different colors. Windows. Mac O uh O X Mass Mac Mac OS X O X S Jesus Christ I own a Mac I use a Mac on a daily basis what is it called Mac OS oh my god Mac OS and then Linux So these are all, all operating system and op if you don't know what an operating system it's it's the thing that runs your entire computer uh, this is the operating system. You can see Windows. I'm using Windows. Uh, an operating system manages all the other applications um, in your computer. You can run applications using it. Like your computer wouldn't be able to do anything without an operating system. Right? It's the system that runs. It's the biggest software that runs your computer and make it work together. All right. So your 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 PC and OS, they're communicating between each other, right? What's next? You have my friend, your tiny, teeny little 2D game that you wrote and you're so proud of and you think it's the best thing in the world, right? 
the question is right your pc is over here at the top right your pc has a cpu gpu right this is your pc right your pc has a cpu and gpu how do you write a software and how does your game communicates with the gpu and how do we send instructions to tell the gpu to or your graphic processing unit to render something on the screen to draw an image how does that happen well you have a piece here called gpu drivers right this is your gpu drivers a driver you can have multiple drivers a driver is a piece of software first of all a driver is a piece of software that runs on the operating system that helps the operating system communicate with a specific device let me give you an example my sound card in order for me to hear audio the operating system windows needs to communicate with my sound card so here's my sound card sound sound card the operating system and these guys need to communicate between each other how do they do it they have they need something in between right they need a driver so instead of the sound card and the operating system communicating between each other the the oh you install this driver on your computer so the os communicates with the driver and the driver communicates with the graphics card and driver is just a piece of software it's like a it's like a translator it it's a way for the operating system and the the actual device uh it's a way for them to understand each other and communicate between each other so same thing with a with a gpu or a graphics card a graphics card needs a driver whether your graphics card is from nvidia you have to do green for nvidia because nvidia or amd whether your gpu or your graphics card is from nvidia or, or, or amd you need a way to communicate your game needs a way to communicate with your gpu we do that by the driver so your game sends an instruction to your driver it tells it to draw a triangle or draw an image your gpu sends a message or communicates with the operating system and the operating system is communicating with your gpu um right so your drivers without your drivers operating system cannot figure out what gpu you're running on oh hold on hold on i messed up this drawing oh so whoops whoops, whoops. hold on hold up i kind of messed up this um this is your gpu your gpu is communicating your gpu is installed on your operating system uh and your gpu i mean yeah i guess this is fine so your gpu exists so your operating system can understand and communicate with your gpu so i guess your operating system is there uh, the point i'm trying to make is your graphics drivers your gpu driver exist so you can communicate with the gpu and i mean i really didn't have to do the os in here i could have just been like i mean i guess the os exists i mean it's there right your drivers your 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 gpu drivers are installed in windows mac and it allows the operating system to communicate with your graphics card right okay so again uh going back to this game tells your gpu to draw a triangle it does that it sends a command to the drivers 
drivers is communicating with the OS and the driver is communicating also with the GPU. So it's like, hey, GPU, draw a cool image and it draws that image. Right. So without your GPU driver, the, o the OS doesn't understand what what's what's this what's this GPU? What is this device? What do I do with this? Right? So you need the GPU driver. Now the GPU driver has um so here's a question. Why do you have to update your graphics card every once in a while? Like whenever you go out to the NVIDIA website, every few weeks there's a new graphics driver. Why? Well, because there, there are new games that are coming all the time, right? So let's say GTA, GTA 6 just came out. What NVIDIA does, NVIDIA the company, they are working with the game developers, the guys who made GTA. NVIDIA are always working with game developers. So NVIDIA and AMD, sorry, NVIDIA and GTA, they're working together. Um to make GTA 6 as optimized as possible and to run as smoothly as humanly possible. And so they write some code inside the driver. Again, a driver is just a software. They write code in the driver to make GTA 6 run as fast as possible on their graphics card. That's why you're always updating graphics, uh, graphics drivers. Because if a new game just came out, it has, it probably or most likely has a, optimizations for um, that game you just downloaded so for example i have a if i go to my task manager this is loading windows 11 by the way is garbage pretty slow Okay, if I go to my task manager and go to performance, you'll see that I have an AMD Radeon 6900 XT, right? So that is like the top of the line AMD graphics card. Right, and if you see here, this is my memory. I have 64 GB of memory. This is your RAM that I just talked about. This is my CPU, right? It has multiple cores. We haven't even touched cores or talked about cores. We'll talk about cores later on, what they are. But this is my memory. You can see I have 64 GB of memory and I have my graphics card, which is 6900 XT. So if I go to, if I go here and type AMD, if I go to drivers and support and go to graphics card and go to the 6900 series, I have a 6900 XT submit. You will see for Windows 11, a new drivers came out. If I look at the release notes, they fixed some issues with their graphics cards. They have some issues, known issues. But if we look at, for example, so I looked at this version. Let me look at this version. You can see they added support for Back for Blood and the Rift Breaker. Those are two games. They're out. They're released uh, recently. Right, so if I look for back or blood, right, it's a game released uh, recently. So what AMD did essentially, they worked with the developers to add support and optimize this game and make it run as fast as humanly possible on their graphics cards. That's why you have your driver updated every once in a while. Again, driver is just software that that allows you to communicate with the GPU. Without it, we can't communicate with the GPU. Now, there's another reason why we need the driver. The driver has um, implementations, or it has uh, it 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 it. Uh, okay, so the driver updates games, right? It has some code that updates games. It also has OpenGL support, DirectX support, Vulkan support, right? Those are APIs or 
graphic APIs. So OpenGL, you have OpenGL 4.6, DirectX 11 or 12, Vulkan, I think we're at 1.2, Vulkan 1.2. Right? These are all low level graphic APIs. So you might wonder and ask, what's a graphic API? What is that? Well, essentially, AMD and NVIDIA, they both have different architectures, right? Their GPUs work differently. So the way NVIDIA processes triangles, the way NVIDIA draws things on the screen is different from AMD. So AMD might be faster doing this, NVIDIA might be faster doing that. They, they essentially do the same thing. They all draw 3D models. They all render graphics. They draw graphics on the screen. But the way they do it is differently. So OpenGL, DirectX, and Vulkan, they are graphic uh, API specific. They're, gra they're graphics API, right? And so think of these APIs as a document. It is actually a document. It's a specification. These guys... Um, there, there, OpenGL is a specification that basically says, if you write this line of code, let's say draw triangle. If you have written this line of code that says draw triangle, and let's say we're mainly let's say we're mainly talking about OpenGL. It applies the same to DirectX and Vulkan. But let's say we're talking about OpenGL for now. If a programmer uses the OpenGL 4.6 API and he uses or he writes this line of code, draw a triangle, what should appear on the screen is a white triangle. So, what NVIDIA does, and AMD, both NVIDIA and AMD, they go to this document. It's an actual document. They read the document. They see there's something called draw triangle, a line of code that says draw triangle. They read more about this and see that it reads something along the lines, if someone writes this line of code, you should draw a white triangle on the screen. So, in their graphics drivers, the GPU, they program the graphics driver to say if someone uses this line of code or writes this line of code, the output should be a white triangle, not a blue triangle, not a pink triangle, not a square, not a circle, not a blue square, not a, not a pink circle, right? It should be a white triangle. And this document is updated every few years or every few months. And that's why you need to update your graphics drivers. That's the other reason you have to update your graphics drivers. Not only do they add support for video games, they also add support for these graphic APIs. And we use these graphic APIs to tell the GPU to draw something. So we use OpenGL. This is a graphics API. We use this piece of software, or it's not a piece of software, well, it's, we use this, um, let's say piece of software. We use this piece of software, OpenGL, to tell, to program our game, to tell the GPU, uh, hey, if I write this line of code, I'm supposed to draw a triangle. We use DirectX to draw things on the screen. We use Vulkan to draw things on the screen. We use OpenGL to draw things on the screen. So OpenGL might have draw a triangle, DirectX 11 and 12, they might say a draw a white triangle, and Vulkan might say a draw a white triangle with three dots, for example, right? They all are a little bit different, but essentially all these three functions, they show you the same thing, a, triangle, a white triangle, right? So OpenGL is uh, managed by its own company, Coronas Group. Coronas Group, right? Um, so if you type here, the Coronas Group, 
I, I, I sang that. Uh, I forgot the H. So Coronas Group, the Coronas Group, they manage OpenGL and Vulkan. All right. And DirectX 11 and 12, they're managed by Microsoft. So, and these guys, Microsoft and the Coronas Group, they created these graphic APIs. It's just a document that basically instructs manufacturers, graphic card manufacturers, people who make these graphics cards, AMD and NVIDIA. They tell them, read this document. When a programmer writes this line of code, this is supposed to happen. When the programmer writes this line of code, this is supposed to happen. So we can have another line of code that say draw circle, right? So if a programmer says draw circle, you should see a circle on the screen, right? So that's what a graphics API is, right? And that's why we need the driver because these graphic APIs, these documents, that's written by Microsoft and Corona's group, they're updated regularly every few months, every year or two. And so the driver has to be updated because NVIDIA and AMD, they're writing this software. This driver is a software where they're writing it. They're updating it always to support the latest game, the latest graphic APIs, which is very important. Without the driver, we can't communicate with the GPU. Otherwise the operating system will be like, whoa, what's a graphics card? Me no understand that though. I know I know nothing. Hello. I don't know what accent or language that was. It's, don't worry about it. Right? So the Aubrey system needs to communicate with the GPU. And it does that using the driver. Okay. So your 2D game says, hey, I would like to draw a square. That is sent to the driver. Driver communicates with the operating system and the GPU and sends something in the GPU. Now There are a few layers missing here, right? So in reality, this looks something like this. 2D game. S F M L Open G L. Okay. So Open G the OpenGL communicates with the driver, uh, or OpenGL is in the driver. So OpenGL is inside the graphics driver. SFML is communicating with OpenGL and the driver. So you know what? let's just do, let's do this. Graphics driver, OpenGL, DirectX. So these are all graphics cards. Uh, gra so these are all graphic APIs inside the driver. And SFML uses OpenGL. So these guys are communicating between each other. And you, your game, is communicating with SFML. You're using SFML to make your game, right? So rad we can skip SFML altogether and jump into OpenGL directly. But that's a lot harder, a lot, a lot harder. So we're going to do that like later, way down the line. As for a beginner, you want to rely on something like SFML. Now, what if you're using Unity or Unreal? Well, let's do Unity here. Right? And let's do Unreal here. Right? And your 2D game is communicating with Unreal, for example. Then Unreal communicates with OpenGL and DirectX, which is on the graphics driver. The driver communicates with the GPU. So what they're using Unreal, you, same thing with Unity, by the way. So your game is on Unity. Unity is communicating with the GPU driver and OpenGL, right? We don't communicate directly with the GPU driver. We, we use OpenGL as a way to communicate. So we program with C++ and OpenGL. We program with C++ and DirectX. And those are a way... Uh, and, and the GPU understand these two APIs, right? The GPU understand this and it understands this. So we can't, we cannot directly interact with the driver. The programmer cannot directly interact with the driver. The programmer communicates with the, with OpenGL and DirectX. Okay. So we can build our game on OpenGL. 
we can build our game on DirectX directly, but that's much harder. So we use either Unity, SFML, or Unreal. So our game built on Unity. Unity handles OpenGL and DirectX, right? And you have, or you can have your game built on Unreal, and Unreal or implements OpenGL and DirectX. Right. So OpenGL and DirectX are like SFML. They're just a library that you can use so the GPU can understand what you want to do. Okay. So that's the GPU part of this. That was a lot. That was a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of information. A ton of information. So I hope this made sense. Right. Uh, rather, our game going and communicating with OpenGL, or our game is written in OpenGL and DirectX. Uh, we're going to write our game with SFML and C++. And SFML is written in OpenGL, and OpenGL is talking with the driver. Uh, or OpenGL is in the driver, and the driver is communicating with the GPU. All right. So... That is that. That is all that. If you guys have any questions, again, do let me know. All right. Cool. Uh, we talked a lot. So we, we covered a lot. So uh, we covered what I want to do for this course. Right. We covered the how many what a computer is. We covered how a computer works and what's inside a computer. Uh, we covered the types of memory or how fast they are. A server is not a memory. It's just for argument's sake, let's say it is. Um, because it's over the internet or whatever. We talked about how we get started with programming, what you need, right? Editor, compiler, assembler, right? And then we talked about what a graphics card driver and why do we need to update our graphics card drivers. And we talked about what graphic APIs are, right? Graphic APIs and what SFML is. So rather than our game going and communicating with OpenGL, again, I say communicating, I mean written. Rather than writing our game in OpenGL and C++, we write it in SFML. SFML is written in OpenGL with OpenGL. Cool. So all that is done. Uh, we can now get started and make a game. Uh, this has been an hour and 47 minute stream. So what I think I'll do, I'll stop.